Okay, so we'll just go ahead and get started. We still have people coming on. Hello and welcome to Working Rangelands Wednesdays, where we explore topics around rangeland agriculture in California and across the West. I'm Leslie Roach, a Cooperative Extension Specialist in Rangeland Science and Management with the University of California, Davis. And I'm Dan Macon. I'm a Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor with UC Cooperative Extension, covering uh, Placer, Nevada, Sutter, and Yuba counties. And my name is Grace Woodmancy. I'm a graduate student at UC Davis, and Leslie and Dan are my advisors. So before we get started, we are recording this webinar, and it will be posted later on our UC Rangelands YouTube channel. For our live webinar participants, we ask that you use the chat or Q&A pods to type your questions. We'll keep an eye on questions, and we'll have time in the last part of the hour to follow up with our guest speaker. So we are excited today to have Dr. Ken Tate, Professor and Russell L. Rosicci Endowed Chair in Rangeland Watershed Sciences. Ken is here to talk uh, today with us a bit about current issues surrounding grazing and water quality on California's rangelands and pastures. So we'll just get right to it and hand over the controls to Ken. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody and um, hopefully all this uh, technology will go well. Um, so, I, like always, I, when I speak on this topic, um, it's, it's me presenting, but there's a whole cast of characters, graduate students, faculty member, colleagues, um, folks in agencies, ranchers, and others that have contributed to this research in, in many ways, and, and none of it would be possible without that partnership. Um, so, I thought I'd give just a bit of background on uh, California's rangeland watersheds, kind of what they are. Um, and then talk about two topics that have been at least on my plate quite a bit in the last year and, and I think are important to a lot of people. Um, so California's range on watersheds represent about, about 50 million acres, about one half of the state's land area. Um, about 80% of the surface waters that we use to drink, to recreate, to irrigate in um, the state of California either are derived from or stored in rangeland watersheds and they serve as a forage base for the state's uh, livestock industry. So these are, these are grazed landscapes. Um, and our goal for them is to provide multiple outcomes, including um, safe water um, for these various um, activities. We also have about 80, 800,000 acres of irrigated pasture. And these are uh, pastures that are irrigated during the summer. Um, they provide essential summer forage for the livestock community. Uh, particularly in central and northern California. Um, they provide some drought resilience in years where we have a low average rainfall and the winter growing season is a bit shorter. They provide ranchers with some opportunities to, to adjust to that. And we have kind of three groups of irrigated pastures. We've got valley pastures, which are flood irrigated lands, say in the Central Valley or San Joaquin Valley, um, low elevation. Where Dan is at in the foothills, um, we have foothill pastures that are irrigated. And then we have higher elevation mountain meadow systems that are irrigated uh, throughout the uh, northern Sierra Nevada and Southern Cascade. And so thinking about these two systems is, is the, the systems that I'm gonna be talking about. Some of, the, some of the current water quality and grazing related issues that uh, I think a lot of us have been dealing with or working on have been associated with microbial water quality um, and livestock management on these lands and nutrient loading on these lands from livestock, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus. So those will be the two topics I dig into a bit today. Um, so I, I arrived in California in 1995 to, to take this position and provide some research capacity on water quality and, and livestock management. And very quickly, the, the issue of microbial water quality popped up on, on our radar and it has continued to be a topic of concern and interest on these lands uh, till today. Kind of the, I'd say the defining, you know, beginning point of, of these concerns were concerns in 1997 um, in the Bay Area driven by the city of San Francisco and concerns of, of many stakeholders about whether or not livestock which were grazing around reservoirs that the city um, operates for drinking water whether those livestock were a source of a pathogen called cryptosporidium. It's a protozoal parasite. Um, it creates, like many of these pathogens, uh, GI-related illness. And for folks that have got immune, immunocompromised uh, compromised immune systems or, or other 
other issues, um, it could potentially be fatal. For the vast majority of us, we get flu-like symptoms often. It's not diagnosed as, as C. parvum, and, and our bodies are able to shed it and we get over it. But you can see from the news coverage there around the Bay Area that you know, it started out as quite a, quite a concern. You know, tiny parasite has water districts, cattle ranchers kind of wrapped around the axle. Then in the middle, a water district targets cattle. And then you'll see with some science and uh, coordination, communication, um, some changes in management, water district backs away from cattle raising ban around these lakes. And so that's, that's kind of that was my entree, if you will, into this topic. And as I said, this topic, you know, folks are concerned about it, and that's that's all fine. Um, that's legitimate that there that there are concerns about land use and human health. Um, Sacramento Bee in 2010 um, had a front page exclusive. Some of the quotes that they had from from stakeholders are, are listed here, um, and it pulled, pointed a lot of concern towards um, livestock grazing on, on public lands, federal public lands. So with that kind of backdrop, kind of the question that I get a lot, and I think the issue that I deal with a lot as a scientist is, so if I see a cow near a creek, is the water unsafe? In my experience over 25 years of doing this, um, there are both scientific and policy answers to that question. Uh, scientific answer, as always, the scientific answer is always it depends. Um, and in particular in California, there's a policy answer that also is it depends. So we're gonna drill down into this a little bit and uh, talk about it. We'll start with the science and then go from there to the policy a bit. <clears throat> so thinking about the science, um, so our group, uh, Rob Atwell, who's an epidemiologist with the vet school, Randy Dahlgren, who's a biogeochemist at, at Davis and many others, um, kind of came, about, came at this question of what are the sources of potential water quality concern on these rangelands? We've got livestock sources, we've got backgrounds, so natural sources, we've got other sources that are out there, um, and how that directly relates to water quality conditions. In order to understand how these sources might connect to water quality impairment or not, we have to understand the kind of the fate and transport of a pathogen that might be excreted from a cow in a fecal pad that lands out on a rangeland, what, what happens to that? And does it create risk? And then as we're all interested in, what can we do in terms of management to kind of create a control um, and, and mitigate any potential negative outcomes? So what are, what are microbial pollutants? What are we talking about? And so microbial pollutants is a big catch-all for basically microbes um, that um, might be fecal born that uh, might be in water. And so what we're really concerned about is on the top of this slide are pathogens. Pathogens are things that can infect humans and create illness and potentially mortality um, if, if the individual is, is, is a compromised system. And the, the two that we've spent a lot of time on that often you hear about relative to livestock are Cryptosporin parvum and E. coli 0157H7, which I think everybody's heard of relative to spinach and leafy green outbreaks. Those, those things are what we care about, but they're often difficult to monitor for. They're difficult to enumerate in the lab. Some of them you know, are quite expensive to monitor and track. And so what historically we've done nationally and internationally is we rely on monitoring fecal indicator bacteria that are not pathogenic, um, most likely will not make you sick, um, that we hope are indicative of fecal contamination of water and the potential presence of water, of, of pathogens in that water. So you, we commonly hear the term fecal coliform or total coliform. Um, I use the term indicator E. coli because the broad category of, of, of E. coli is used as, a, as an indicator. And these, uh, our hope is that, our hope is that ideally there is a correlation between the fecal indicator bacteria and pathogens in water. So if we kind of take this, this conceptual Diagram here, I've got the yellow dots are where you went out and you grabbed a water sample out of a water body of concern and you processed it in the laboratory for fecal indicator bacteria, say fecal coliform. You also process that same sample for a pathogen of concern, say C. parvum. And hopefully there's correlation between those concentrations such that when fecal indicator bacteria levels are at a certain level, they're comparable to a level of concern in, in C. parvum, and that allows us to conceptually 
set a water quality standard or a level of concern, whereas if, if fecal coliform gets above, say, 200, then the probability that the pa a pathogen is there becomes unacceptable. And that's kind of how we get to those standards. So, so we're hoping that those types of correlations exist because we're kind of building everything we do on this correlation. So thinking then, do back to this question of where we're at with the science, where now that we've defined microbial pollution, um, do cattle then shed pathogens in their feces that could become a waterborne threat to human health? It's what we care about are the pathogens. So this was the question we had 25 years ago is, do cattle on rangelands have cryptosporidium parvum? Yes or no? And if they do, how bad do they have it? And so we went out, Rob Atwell led this and did a series of, of, of studies, cross-sectional surveys, where you basically go out and work with a, a lot of different ranchers who graciously give you access to basically come and take fecal samples from their cattle while they're processing them for whatever kind of health, herd health issues they're doing at the time. And we did, a, we did a series of studies. The most recent and most relevant is published by Lee et al. in Rangeland Ecology Management just last year. They went back out with the most up-to-date uh, taxonomic tools available to, quanti to basically determine, identify the different species of crypto um, in fecal samples from 1,400 cattle across 20 ranches. The ranches were both rangeland and irrigated pasture settings, so this applies to cattle in both types of settings. And um, basically what they found was the cryptos, as well as the Girardia, results I don't show for Girardia, the crypto species identified in these cattle were minimally infectious for humans, indicating low risk. So what we mean by that is the C. parvum here at 0% out of the 68 or whatever number of head that were, that were had the genus uh, crypt crypto, cryptosporidium, um, had, were actually the species parvum, which is the one that we're concerned about. The vast majority were Ryani, Ranii, at 75%. So these, um, these are really great findings. It's good news. Um, and it's interesting after 25 years of studying everything you can study about crypto and the environment on rangelands, um, in the end, we find out that with modern techniques, it's, it's really, I wouldn't say it's not, an, I wouldn't say it's a non-issue, but it's certainly a minor issue, most likely. Um, e. coli was the other one I talked about, 0157H7. So, Thinking about uh, produce um, E. coli related to uh, produce uh, produce related E. coli outbreaks uh, following the 20, 2007 2006 outbreak of E. coli from the Central Coast, um, Rob Atwell and colleagues <coughs> did a huge survey. Uh, basically, collected fecal material from a, a suite of different species out there. Um, kind of a who, who did it? Um, can they identify who which species had? E. coli 0157, and you see they were able to sample a suite of critters. The, um, the first number, they're like peripheral pig. The 10 is, there was 10 pigs out of 200 that tested positive. And so you can see down at the bottom, they tested beef cattle. They had 2,700 beef cattle were, were sampled. That's a huge number of animals, and 68 of them were positive, so about 2.5%. So you can kind of... see there you start um, there's a good number of, of other sources out there and including grazing including livestock and they're all shedding at they're, they're all have a prevalence of about the same level and so if we kind of put that into this start accumulating knowledge from this in these scientific endeavors if we and think about the top box which is what are the sources all livestock shed indicator bacteria fecal indicator bacteria, similar to all other species, dogs, cats, us, gophers, we're all shedding fecal coliform and E. coli, indicator E. coli in our feces um, at very high levels. Um, the vast majority of it is not pathogenic. Less than 3% of cattle um, shed E. coli 0157H7 at, and they shed at low levels, similar to other sources. Um, we consistently find that in rangeland settings, so be careful not talking about feedlot cattle or other cattle. These are cattle out on rangelands. And the crypto, crypto and uh, giardia shed by cattle is very likely not infectious to humans. So thinking then, so 
okay, so we're thinking about risk, right? Is that cow standing there a risk to me? So does she have it? Yes or no? And then the next is, okay, she has it. What is the risk that those pathogens actually become waterborne, that they actually get deposited in into water that I'm going to swim in or drink? Um, and so that's the whole pollutant transport and environmental fate dynamic side of it. There's probably 25 research papers that we've completed on that topic. I'm not going to bludgeon you with all of them. I'm going to give you the big results that I think are important and uh, kind of go from there. So we find that these microbes perish in fecal pats within days on rangelands for most of the year. Um, basically when we have spring, summer, fall temperatures where we've got warm conditions, um, we see a fairly um, substantial decay in say cryptosporidium oocysts that are viable in those fecal pats. And there's various, there's various mechanisms that, that lead to that. With crypto what happens is, is the fecal pat is sitting out there in the sun, it warms up and as it warms up and passes through the body temperature of a host, us or a cow, about 100 degrees, 98 to 100 degrees, they actually hatch. They hatch and they're in, a, they're in an unfriendly environment immediately perish because they're not in a GI tract. So there's, there's mechanisms out there that are cleansing the range during those spring, summer, uh, fall periods with warmer temperatures. During winter or during irrigation events on, on summer irrigated pasture, we find that these microbes, we put out microbes in fecal pats, ran water over them and basically did a mass balance and find that about 99.99% .99 of the microbes are stuck within one yard of the fecal pat. So the systems are really sticky. They really catch these microbes and it's, it's, they don't travel very far. So we're really looking at fecal pats that are deposited directly in water as being those of concern. And, us and others have found that with free-ranging cattle, approximately 5% of fecal pats are deposited kind of in or in, in stream or in a water body or within 10, 10 yards of that water body is probably a, a pretty good number. If, if more is happening than that, there's probably a management problem. So thinking about the it depends, well, what about the management that's occurring at the site? Is it good management? Is it poor management? Is it risky management uh, in terms of, you know, allowing these pathogens to become a waterborne threat. And so we've done a lot of work looking at management, both BMPs as well as risk factors. Uh, we always thought the best way to find good, best management practices to safeguard water from a land use is to understand how that land use first poses a risk. Then you can create a, a barrier. And so we went out um, in Northeastern California, David Lyle and Don Lancaster, who are farm advisors up there, uh, in last in Modoc County, we identified 10 stream breaches. Um, in each of these cases, the streams ran through a, a mountain irrigated pasture, ran through it or beside it, where water was diverted out of the stream at the top of the pasture, spread across the pasture as flood irrigation to, uh, to irrigate that, that pasture and keep it alive during the summer. And then some variable amounts of tailwater would come back into that same stream um, as, a, as a, that pasture was irrigated. And so we did above and below monitoring um, at these 10 sites over the course of the summer irrigation season. And we look in here at the differences between below and above, so below minus above. So the, the three on top, streams one, two, and three, these are sorted from basically sinks where there was more, e there's higher E. coli concentration in stream water above the pasture than below it after it been irrigated. So those are pastures that are basically cleaning up water and taking E. coli out of it. Four, five, and six, we essentially had no real change. And then seven, eight, seven through 10, you can see we had source pastures. And so those pastures were increasing concentrations downstream. So quite a lot of variability here and something we can learn a lot from in terms of how does pasture, how does pasture management create or mitigate risk of microbial transport. So we can kind of characterize pastures which increased microbial concentration, what I call them sources. So they tended to have relatively high irrigation runoff rates, so a lot of water running off of those pastures, a lot of transport potential. They had relatively high stocking rates, stocking rates actually that, that were higher than we would recommend just from a production perspective. Um, often there was grazing, there were livestock actively grazing the, the pasture while it was being irrigated. So kind of water running under hoofs, which you can imagine would dislodge quite a lot of other stuff. Uh, often they discharged into low flow streams. We know one of the solutions to pollution, right, is dilution. And so if you've got dirty water coming into a low volume of clean water, 
you're going to have a greater impact than, than the other way around. And then oftentimes there was a, a significant amount of direct livestock access to the stream channels themselves. Thinking about pastures that were a sink, um, what we we're looking for, which is great, um, they tended to have relatively low irrigation runoff rates, so not a lot of transport capacity. Um, they had moderate stocking rates, kind of in line with what we would recommend for optimizing pasture production and livestock performance. Um, they tended to rotate grazing relative to irrigation so that livestock were, at least if not always, were sometimes rotated out of a part of a pasture before it was irrigated. Uh, some of them had either a wetland or a buffer or what we call a tailwater pasture that basically kind of was there to filter tailwater before it went off back off into the stream. And they tended to have limited direct livestock access to the streams. So management definitely will influence um, risk, uh, positive and negative. So if we kind of put that all together, we've got a quite a bit of knowledge about the likelihood, the conditional probabilities that an animal is infected with a pathogen. The pathogen is deposited in a stream and where it can become waterborne, uh, fecal, uh, become a waterborne pathogen. Uh, and then we have quite a lot of information about on-site management that um, can help us characterize or identify um, locations, practices, uh, scenarios where risk would be high versus low. So that's the, the it depends part from the scientific perspective. We think about policy, there's all kinds of policy around this. There's federal policy, the WHO has international policy um, on the idea that we are looking for the correct fecal indicator bacteria uh, to monitor and regulate um, to safeguard human health from, um, from pathogens. And if you read this, the scientific literature, and I'll, I'll share some of that with you, there are serious issues with the whole fecal indicator bacteria approach as a means to protect human health. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm, that doesn't mean we should junk it at all. It's just we should know what it really is, what it was really telling us. And so um, I'm, I'm posting these up because I know you can all either hit pause when you watch the recording um, or get these papers. If you're unable to get these papers, you're not at a university, you don't have access to a library, well, let me know. I'll send information to you. I'll let Leslie know. We want you guys to be able to access papers and research um, for yourself so you can go read and see if, if what I'm telling you can, is congruent with what folks are finding. And so this is a great review by Field and Somatopore, um, fecal source tracking, the indicator paradigm, and managing water quality. And just a quote out of there, fecal indicator bacteria are not well correlated with pathogenic pretty much anything, Salmonella, Crypto, Giardia, which is a challenge because recall, we were hoping that they are. We did some research here in California. We went below three or four grazed, irrigated mountain meadow systems in California and collected a total of 102 samples. And we processed those samples for fecal coliform. We also processed them from, uh, for cryptosporidium parvum. And so these are, these are not fake data, these are real data. And so each of the yellow balls there is a is the level of fecal coliform in a sample and the corresponding level of C parvum. And you can see from my question mark line there, where, where's our trend, where's our relationship? If anything, it looks like um, rather than seeing increasing probability of pathogen with increasing indicator bacteria, which is the way it's supposed to work, it, it almost looks like it might be the other way around. And alarmingly, we see some of our highest concentrations of C parvum in samples where fecal coliform was very low, well within any standard. That, it, regardless of grazing or any other land use, that is a concern. So fecal indicator bacteria are not perfect. They are meant to be proxies or indicators of a potential pathogen presence. And I, I, I hear this a lot, like, but oh, we saw fecal coliform, you know, two units above the standard, there must be a problem. Maybe there's a problem. It's worth investigating. You absolutely should do some, some site assessments the watershed assessment, uh, we'll look at the site, maybe do some additional monitoring, but it doesn't, you shouldn't ring the alarm too fast because it, it may or may not um, indicate a real problem. The other side of that is we're below a standard, so we shouldn't be concerned. Perhaps you should be. You take that with a grain of salt. So you have to ask, there's three or four or five different fecal indicator bacteria out there that we could use. Um, are some better than others? And, um, we have some guidance on this. Um, for USEPA, 
in 2012, put out a recreational water quality standard stating that scientific advancements in microbiological, statistical, and epidemiological methods have demonstrated that intercoccidiae and E. coli are better indicators than fecal col than, of fecal contamination than total coliforms and fecal coliforms. The actual the way the scientific community is talking about it now, you'll see it in modern or more modern papers, is fecal coliform is actually a misnomer. Um, it, it really doesn't mean that coliforms are fecal in nature. The, the laboratory method actually enumerates what we call thermotolerant coliforms, which are, those are simply able to withstand the relatively high temperature of incubation that this test uses in the lab. It doesn't really differentiate fecal from non-fecal environmental coliforms, and therein lies one of the big problems, is there's a lot of false positives because of non-fecal coliforms. Um, if you want to read on this, there's a great two-page synopsis by Doyle and Erickson's in um, Microbe, which is the and the flagship journal for the American Society for Microbiology, where they talk about closing the door on the fecal coliform assay. And it starts with starting with its inception in 1904, fecal coliform assay. So, so there's a lot of old science in using fecal coliform as a standard. Um, the state of California um, is unique in that since there is um, a diversity of, of responsibility and leadership in establishing water quality policy in the state, we have a diversity of microbial standards across the state. Um, in 2019, uh, California State Water Board adopted US EPA's 2012 recommendation for an E. coli standard that's based on either a mean of all samples being less than 100 colony forming units or a statistical threshold value that no more than 10% uh, of samples can be above a number of, say, 320. Um, across the various regional boards and across various programs within regional boards, um, you'll find fecal coliform standards that are still in the books um, that range anywhere from means of 20 to 200 fecal coliforms and STVs uh, percentages that range anywhere from 40 to 400. And this, this can and does create significantly different and even contradictory impressions of microbial water quality conditions across rangeland watersheds. And, and this has been a real challenge uh, for a lot of us dealing with this issue at the statewide level. So we'll, to iterate this, we'll talk about a, a paper that is in revision as it, we'll, we'll get it published in another week or two. Um, microbial water quality associated with livestock recreation rural residences. And so we went into three rural watersheds in California, the Upper Susan River, the Upper Stanislaus River, and the Upper East Walker River. And we identified stream sample sites, 77 of them. Uh, we sampled over the course of the 2016 uh, summer period when recreation, grazing, uh, rural residence occupancy are probably maximum in that landscape. And we, um, we took a total of 595 samples, water samples. We analyzed them for both indicator E. coli and fecal coliforms. So what did we find relative to standards in the area? So if we think about it, we calculate this. So what this is, is at each sample site, say we collected nine to 10 samples per sample site at 77 sites total, um, we calculated the mean uh, concentration for fecal coliform and E. coli. And then we calculated from that the percentage of sites whose E. coli um, or fecal coliform mean concentration exceeded the standard um, in question, the benchmark in question. And so you can see overall we had 77 sites 40 of those sites were recreation sites, camp sites, swimming sites, things like that. 31 were key grazing areas where livestock inhabit uh, meadows and areas where they spend quite a bit of time grazing during the, uh, during the summer period. And then we were able to sample six residences um, that were proximate to streams and that we could get access to sample. You'll see for overall, for E. coli, about 14% of sites had an exceedance um, for the mean standard, none did for the 320 for grazing and recreation is about 10 and 13 percent. So that's saying the grazing one there is saying about about you know um, 87 percent of sites met the standard. So there's certainly some problems and things to go do, but that's that's not that bad. One might argue. If we look at the standard of 200 or 400 for fecal coliform, which is a standard that Region 5 uses, uh, or at least is on their books, was on their books at the time of this study. Um, you see, then we'll just look at the overall, just because it's easier to track one. 
uh, we go from 14% to a 22% exceedance rate. So it bumps up across the board the exceedances that would be calculated based on the policy, based on the fecal indicator bacteria policy that was being used. If we go to region six, which is the east side of the Sierra Nevada, we have a standard of, of 20 um, for the mean. You can see across the board with that standard, with that policy, we have substantial exceedances across the board, whether it be grazing or recreation um, or residences. And so if we set E. coli as the referent, as the best available fecal indicator bacteria out there, which is what basically what we have to do, because that is, um, that is the guidance from the EPA and it's good guidance. Uh, it's certainly not a perfect indicator, but of the ones available, it is considered the best. And we calculate what I'm calling an exceedance inflation. So compared to US EPA and State Water Board's recommendation for E. coli as a standard, we see a 57% inflation by using a fecal coliform standard of 200. We'd see almost a, almost a, almost a 500% inflation using a fecal coliform standard of 20. This has a lot of implications because one of the points of monitoring in indicators like these is to direct limited resources, BMP implementation, time, money, planning towards real problems, places where there really are problems. And it's really important to be able to efficiently do that. If, if we're in a situation where 79% of our sites are de deemed to be exceeding, or 81% if it's grazing, um, and in reality it's a much lower number, we're kind of clouding in the water, if you will. And it really makes it difficult to decide and make informed decisions about where to allocate resources. So on California range ends, in part, the determination of safe might very well depend on your zip code, and what, what policy your, your, um, your water board or other organizations are enforcing at the time. And so harmonizing to an E. coli standard would go a long way in accurately identifying and mitigating true problems on range lands. And I think regardless of land use, just in general, um, it's a good thing to do. And there's a strong science base to, to, to support it and it'll help us communicate uh, more effectively about and be on the same page, if you will, about the magnitude of problems and how to identify problems and where to allocate resources. So kind of moving on to um, nutrient loading. So that's a lot on my good water quality. Um, I'm not talking a lot about best management practices here for water, my good water quality. We will come back to this follow-up webinar because that's a whole other topic onto itself um, that builds upon what we've talked about so far today in terms of microbial water quality. And so where we do see those problems, those 13 or 14% um, here, what can we do about them? What can we do about them? And what can we do to make sure that the 87% that were not exceeding standard stay that way? Um, so moving on then to talking a bit about nutrient loading. So I, nutrient loading has kind of popped up on our radar in the last couple of years. It, it's not something we've spent, we spent a lot of time on understanding nutrient dynamics in California rangelands um, early in our careers, um, particularly just some fundamental biogeochemistry about these unique systems. But we not, we, and we did a quite a bit of work to kind of convince ourselves where we were at with grazing nutrient loading. Um, but there's been a renewed of a resurgence of, of interest in nutrient loading in general on some of our rangeland systems due to um, issues related with eutrophication and subsequent harmful, harmful algal blooms called HABs. And so eutrophication occurs when excessive nutrients are contributed to a water body, generally from runoff from, from land uses. And it causes excessive algal growth or blooms, if you will kind of these green blooms that you can see here. Uh, that depletes oxygen as those plants respire at night, they utilize oxygen and um, that can pull dissolved oxygen levels down in uh, water bodies and basically suffocate uh, fish and other uh, aquatic species. And so it can result in a uh, cascade, a suite of negative outcomes. So it's certainly not something we want to see happening. We have a har harmful algal bloom can occur when, when these blooms that are generated by eutrophication contain types of cyanobacter that produce toxins which cause gastrointestinal illness and liver damage. And these are harmful to humans as well as, as, well as animals and wildlife. So these are things we want to avoid. And these are extreme cases of it, the photos of it. 
And so I think it's important when we, when, when I talk to, I get questions about that type of thing, people say, well, livestock caused this. And absolutely, livestock can lead to eutrophication. Um, you have to remember that livestock agriculture is a big place. It's, it's a lot of different sectors, uh, including cow-calf, which we have on rangelands, um, uh, feedlot situations, dairy situation, we have poultry. So if you look broadly at the literature on eutrophication in livestock agriculture, you'll see, yes, uh, where we have instances such as confined animal feeding operations where there are substantial imports of external nitrogen and feed that are brought into a system that normally wouldn't be there, adding nitrogen to the system. Um, or if we've got a fertilized pasture production system where we're adding fertilizer to uh, improve pastures to increase their productivity, definitely there are strong linkages uh, between those activities and the potential for nitrogen and particularly nitrogen loss either via leaching in groundwater or surface runoff that can lead to eutrophication and other issues. Um, the question is, are rangeland and pasture livestock in California a significant source of external nitrogen? And the answer is not really. Um, well, one of, the, one of the things that make rangelands, rangelands is that the highest agricultural use of those lands is grazing by livestock. And so the, the animals are harvesting forage that is already in place, the nitrogen's already there, it's part of the system. It might have been contributed in, uh, ex in, externally from some other source, but once it's there, they themselves are not bringing any new nutrients into the system. We don't fertilize the systems. Uh, we found in um, most of our irrigated pasture, uh, very little fertilization occurs. Um, when we do not bring in a lot of feedstuffs, um, a lot of hay and, and other uh, uh, corn and things like that. So we've had concerns, several reservoirs that are eutrophied north and south California and, and have been raised as a concern. One of them is Eagle Lake. Um, this is a, a Google Earth shot of Eagle Lake and you can see on the north end of it, the green water. That's, those are, that's the shallow part of the lake. The waters are shallow there. Um, they're warmer. Um, they tend to turn over more because of, of wind. Um, and you can see that there's substantial eutrophication that occurs there, particularly as we get into mid summer and early fall. And there's been documented instances of, of uh, HABs associated with those eutrophication events. The southern section is deep, deep water, and it doesn't suffer uh, quite the same fate as the north end of the lake. Surrounding the, um, the area to the west, there are some numerous, up uh, Pine Creek, there are numerous um, Forest Service grazing allotments where there are livestock grazing in this landscape on Forest Service administered public lands. There's embedded private lands throughout. And then to the north and to the east, there are large BLM grazing allotments that, that are to this area. And we focused as part of a case study to, okay, let's answer this question. What, what, are, what is the potential contribution of livestock in terms of nitrogen that might be contributing to this overall problem. We focused on the South Eagle Lake allotment, which is, you can kind of see my cursor here from the, from about right here, Pelican Point, all the way down around to about here is an area, the shoreline area of a larger allotment that goes out like this. Um, that is the South Eagle Lake allotment. And it is pretty much the last of the Forest Service allotments where there is substantial livestock um, access to the shoreline and potential contribute contamination with direct deposition. So we've started this study, we're in process. Uh, we've calculated nitrogen contributions from cattle for South Eagle Lake, and we're starting to go around the lake to check, to calculate for any other units. Um, but South Eagle Lake is the predominant uh, grazing, one of the predominant, two predominant grazing areas there. So it's a substantial component of what would be contributed totally. So relying on the literature, um, there's been quite a lot of work done on just livestock nitrogen cycling, uh, since they are a concern. And so we were able to, from the literature and working with the managers on site, estimate uh, characteristics, uh, document characteristics of the livestock involved, like their body weight, um, the types of classes of animals there, cows, calves, yearlings, bulls estimate their weight gains, and estimate their diet in terms of percent of body weight. And research we'd done in the area earlier gave us information on the percent crude protein of the grass that they're grazing. Um, crude protein is basically nitrogen. And so with that input data, we're able to fairly, fairly well predict 
the amount of nitrogen that's being excreted by livestock, um, either as urine or as fecal material. We looked at both fecal and urine in, this, in these analyses. So based on the information that we had available and the best available science to predict, cows up there are producing about 0.28 pounds per head per day of total nitrogen, bulls about 0.42, you kind of see the numbers there that we got. And based on consumption, body mass, the numbers go up, bigger animals versus smaller. So that's what each animal up there is excreting on a daily basis. Not all of that's ending up in the lake. Um, a lot of it's ending up deposited out in, in the allotment away from the lake. So in order to figure out nitrogen contributions to the lake, we needed to go find out, well, what is the duration of the grazing period? How long are they out there and how many? Do they have access to the lake? When do they have access to the lake? Uh, where do they spend time when they're, say, near the lake? What's the stocking rate? And then lake level. Where is the lake at? And so we went out uh, last summer and during the grazing season, at the end of the grazing season, and these, these pins all mark areas where we went around, these are some, where there's been some active grazing, and we basically counted fecal paths and determined what is the fecal load out there um, so that we can estimate how much material is being deposited near shore. So basically we were able to go out and we know there were 210 cows and calves they had 29 days of access to the lake shore that year. Uh, they generated a total of 175,000 pats based on the science. Um, when we went out and walked transects along these various areas, this is the lake here. This is right at the lake within 30 feet. And here's 30 feet to 300. We we're able to estimate of the total pats that that herd um, defecated during the time period of interest how many of them were here, here, or here. And we found about right here between the near shore and inshore, in, in directly in the end of the lake, about 5% of fecal pads were deposited. Uh, about 23% of the total fecal load from the herd during that time period was here. The remainder was out, out somewhere else, somewhere on the pasture, uh, away from the water. So then we dig in, we wanna go back in time a bit. So we, using, Last year as our calibration, we go back into allotment records. Um, on these public lands allotments, there are allotment records so that every year you know how many animals turned out, when they turned out, what the grazing management strategy was for them. And working with the Eagle Lake Ranger District and Forest Service staff, uh, we were able to, and, and BLM as well, Bureau of Land Management was involved in helping with this. Um, we were able to um, um, estimate the number of animal unit months that were on that allotment each year, 1996 through 2019, we we're also able to estimate based on grazing records, how many of those animal unit months, or that total grazing pressure, um, was either with lakeshore access or with no lakeshore access. And so the red or AUMs that were on the allotment with the livestock were not proximate to the, to the lakeshore and therefore their fecal material wouldn't be a problem. The blue are the AUMs where the livestock were there and had some access. And so you'll notice right off that there's a downward trend in total animal unit months. Um, there have been reductions in uh, livestock numbers on the allotment over this time period. You'll also notice there's a, a reduction in the relative number of AUMs with lakeshore access. And this is due to a series of best management practices. There's a coordinated resource management program up there dedicated to putting in practice BMPs that would um, basically reduce time livestock spent um, near the shore, uh, in part for water quality, but also due to some issues related to archaeological sites, and also issues related with overlap of recreationers and livestock. Cattle in the campgrounds, maybe not the best thing. And so those, those practices have resulted in truly a reduced number of AUMs and a reduced number of AUMs. And so if you get out here in contemporary times, we're looking at about 827 animal unit months in the last decade, compared to the late 90s, about 1,500 animal unit months total. So long story short, we calculate annual load of fecal material. Um, the blue is urine, excuse me, nitrogen. So the blue is urine, nit derived nitrogen. The kind of brown red is or fecal derived nitrogen. The green are fecal pads where that are in when it, in some years the lake comes up. So the blue and the red are directly deposited into the water. The green are years when the lake came up. 
So we're out there in the fall, we're grazing, you leave, you have winter, it snows, the snow runs off and it raises the lake up. So we thought, well, we have to account for the fact that the lake came up and any fecal pads that were within that zone that became re-inundated um, are contributed. Um, and so you can see we had just a couple of years there with the green where the lake actually came up. The, one of the problems, one of the real challenges that's occurring at Eagle Lake is the lake levels are consistently declining, which is exacerbating the issues with eutrophication. So on average, in the last 10 years, and about 66 pounds per year deposited by those 210 cattle um, out on the allotment. Um, we were surprised, honestly, at how small that number was. So to provide some context, then what does that mean? Um, we have to start backing up and take a look at the entire basin and take a look at the entire lake and really understand the full carbon pools and fluxes and inputs that are occurring there. And so some calculations with available data from DWR on, on the lake's nitrogen concentrations. In the upper two meters of the lake, the lake's about 20,000 acres of surface area. In the upper two meters of the lake, there's currently about 120,000 kilograms of total nitrogen. So kilograms to pounds multiplied by about two. Um, and the reason we point out the upper two meters is that's kind of the photo, photosaic zone. That's where light is penetrating and algal blooms can occur. Those are the nutrients that are available to basically support that. We look total at the lake all the way down to its farthest depth, 365,000 um, kilograms. If we look at inputs, so we've got cattle grazing, we're estimating about 30 kilograms. Atmospheric deposition, dry deposition, air pollution is about 40,000. And so relative to these other inputs, livestock are 0.025% of what's already in the lake, 0.075% of what's being deposited as atmospheric deposition. That's trivial. This number is, is, is smaller than the air estimates in these numbers, the air bars, by a lot. So that doesn't mean that grazing along the lake shore should just be okay, no worries, nothing to worry about. There are important aspects of aquatic health and other things to be concerned about but we wouldn't want to put the whole, all our eggs in a basket of managing livestock to save this lake from eutrophication because that's just not gonna happen. Um, one of the things that we are finding in the area, Randy Dahlgren and colleagues of his, is that there's quite a bit of evidence of geologic nitrogen and soluble, soluble reactive phosphorus in groundwater. These are ground, this is a groundwater driven basin and it's likely that phosphorus is driving these eutrophication, it's likely that that phosphorus is coming from groundwater in that's naturally high in phosphorus given the geology. So, so with that, the presence of livestock does not indicate a water quality problem on rangeland and pasture systems in California, but poor management and site conditions can definitely create risk, right? We found that about 14 to 13% of the sites that we studied exceeded EPA's best standard. So there are problems out there, um, but just because we see a livestock on the landscape doesn't mean there's a problem. It's conditional upon management and other, condition, other, other things. I'll talk about this later, but there's a large toolbox of tested feasible practices that exist, which can be used to keep water quality high on grazing lands. Luckily, we have tools. And rangelands have a great capacity to attenuate pollutants from livestock, and we should work with that potential. I mean, think about it, 99.99% of, of microbes are trapped right where they land. Uh, we maintain soil health. We have to manage to maintain the capacity of this land to, to serve as a filter. If we're degrading soil health and infiltration capacity and other things like that, we're not keeping that capacity high and we'll begin to see problems. Um, oops, sorry. Cooperation and collaboration on this is the way forward. There, there's a lot of potential controversy over this topic. Uh, there's a lot of miscommunication and I've been really pleased with the level of interactions and collaboration that I've seen with the state water board, regional water boards, ranchers, Resource Conservation Districts, NRCS, there's a slew of organizations that are truly committed to finding problems where they are, having some confidence that there's a problem, and then working to solve it. And I think that's definitely the way forward. And, and there's a lot of leadership being exhibited that by a lot of organizations. So since I obviously didn't have enough time to talk about BMPs and other things, um, we will be implementing a, a webinar on BMPs at some point in the future, probably within a month or so. And we're going to be initiating a blog series at UC Rangelands on grazing water quality topics. Um, 
to try and pump more information out there given that there's I think 200 people on this on this webinar there's clearly some interest in it so with that Leslie Dan we'll stop sharing well great thank you Ken very much I, it was uh, that's a lot of ground to cover in a very short time frame and we do have a couple of questions here. Um, one of the first ones that came in, and, and I'll make this a little more generally um, focused, but, but how can we um, help ensure that, that the science that you're producing and that others are producing are incorporated into policy decisions, um, either locally or regionally or at the state and federal levels? What are some things we can do to, to engage there? Yeah, I think just more discussion, more collaboration more communication you know I, where i've seen these kind of gaps occur um is when there's not the interaction that there should be you know and and we certainly don't blame by any means and there's there's questions that we don't have answer to there are other scientists out there who are working on things i think the broader we can cast a net to bring together people who want to constructively create good policy constructively resolve these problems uh, you'll find scientists who say the whole concept of the fecal indicator bacteria approach is wrong. You should be directly examining pathogens, right, in 2020, because we have a lot of technology that we didn't have. So investigating the idea of going totally to a pathogen-based, or at least a genus of a pathogen-based approach, um, you'll find some that promote that strongly. So there's, there's a lot of folks, I think, that can provide information and help, help with this. Great. Um, another question with regards to um, to sources, if it if it wasn't livestock, um, for example, in the the cryptosporidium case in the Bay Area, um, or the the leafy greens issue in the Salinas Valley, um, have we ever found the answer of what that source was for those pollutants? Sure, and I, and I wouldn't say that. And there's no been unfortunately it's not been very definitive. It's hard after an outbreak to definitively determine what was the source. And I, I certainly wouldn't say livestock aren't a source and couldn't be a source and haven't been a source by any means. I mean, you saw the E. coli numbers from... Oh. I think we lost you there for a second, Ken. Let me... Oh, there he is. There, there sorry, I, I could... Tell I was breaking up because the panelists all froze. Um, <laughs> yep. Let me, let me turn off my background. Maybe that will help his bandwidth. Yeah, and I will turn off my video. I've, I've turned my video off, and maybe that'll help. Yeah. Now I'll you're back. That. Now you're back. Sorry, I, I turned my video off, so hopefully that'll help and keep us going. I apologize for that. So I, I certainly wouldn't say that livestock couldn't be a source or wasn't a source in some of these outbreaks. We don't have a definitive answer. Um, I think in anything like this, all those actors could have been a source. And the other thing is the most likely place that a human gets a human disease is from a human. And so I think, you know, the idea that there's something out there in the landscape that's creating all of these problems um, we really need to also consider that somewhere in these chains, there may be some human issues that are related. Um, there's a lot greater chance of getting crypto from another human than from a coyote, as an example, or anything. So another, another question related to those, um, those issues. Do pathogenic crypto and, and the specific strain of E. coli reproduce within water bodies? Um, and if not, how do they, how long do they survive once they've entered the water? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, cryptosporidium, the oocysts, they're an egg. So they, they cannot reproduce outside of a GI tract. So they go into the environment and they basically start dying. The bacteria can definitely reproduce under a, appropriate environmental conditions. And so we can absolutely see growth of E. coli, whether it be pathogenic or not, in the environment. Um, that potential to grow outside of the GI tract is one of the issues, right, that makes, it, makes the indicator issue difficult. Um, once things get into water, um, they can survive for quite a little while. 
And so particularly crypto, it, it greatly enhances its rate of survival if it's in, a, in a, a, a wet environment. And one of the sinks that we find for bacteria like E. coli are in streams or, or in stream sediments. And so if we've got a stream, it, the sediments are gonna have some level of E. coli likely greater than the overlying uh, water body. We found this in places like Tomales Bay and others as well. So anything that respend, resuspends of sediments is going to put a bloom of E. coli into the, into the water column. That'll be there for some time period until some distance until it settles out again. Um, but yes, we definitely want to keep these things out of water because they die very quickly on land. Um, they live much better in water. A couple of questions um, relative to uh, Eagle Lake. Um, one is, is the question about the transport of mobile nitrate from urine um, into the groundwater system and whether that's a potential source that, uh, that could be looked at. Yeah, so I was gonna show it, but I ran out of time. And I can, I, can, I can tell you about it and put some papers up. We consistently find in California, whether it be on rangelands or irrigated pasture, these are tend to be, these soils are nitrogen limited. And so any available nitrogen, plant available, microbial available nitrogen hits the soil, it is almost is immediately tied up into an organic form, into the body of a microbe, a soil microbe, or into a plant. We did some research on where we put labeled nitrogen um, nitrate onto an irrigated pasture, um, put it onto the pasture, immediately started irrigating over top of it, flood irrigation, did that for the entire summer. And we could, we, re, we, we recovered all of that labeled nitrogen, N15, uh, within four feet of where we applied it. 3% was recovered in runoff over the entire course of that uh, period, and it was all in an organic form. So it's basically, it had been picked up by plants and microbes as they, in, taken from a mineral form, a plant available form, the kind that would cause algal blooms immediately now in the body of one of those organisms, so it's organic. And as they decompose, as they died and decomposed during the course of the year, we began to see it coming out in an organic form, uh, which is, is, is not, not, not harmful. So we, we, we thought about that, and, but there's a strong body of evidence that these things just, they're sticky. It's a sticky system. Well, great. I think, you know, there are, are, I'm sure, some more questions that will come in and, and uh, we would encourage folks to post those um, once we get this posted on YouTube. Yeah. Um, we'll certainly be, be able to provide that information and, and uh, we will also provide the references that you um, referred to. And I think that would be helpful for folks moving forward as well. So thank you. Absolutely. And, and my email is kwtate. T A T E at ucdavis.edu. And I'd be happy to communicate with anybody about this, any questions they have. And if there's interest, you know, pick some of these topics and do some future webinars on, on some of the smaller bits of it. Um, today, I was just hoping to kind of get some information out there so people would. One of the things I hear from, from folks is, you know, sometimes you scientists, you don't know what we don't, we don't know what we don't know. And so, you know, we're writing papers and generating stuff, and it all seems obvious to us. Um, but if folks don't know that the work's been done, um, then how would they know to ask for it? So we'd be very interested in creating a, a more sustained engagement. So. All right, and we will, be, yeah, we will be sending out announcements for upcoming webinars. If you have a question about that, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, just search UC Rangelands to see the posted videos. And uh, be sure to um, join us next time on Wednesday, June 17th for our next installment, which will feature Dr. Tina Saitone, UC Cooperative Extension Specialist in Livestock and Rangeland Economics. And she'll be talking about pasture, rangeland, and forage drought insurance programs. Uh, thank you again, Ken, for uh, visiting with us today. And thank you, um, all, all of you out there in the um, participant land for joining us. And please take care, everyone.